Speaking of tricks, this is the next session of responding to the environment in humans, and it has to do with the eyes. As always, the department's guidelines are at the beginning of the session, and here you can see what you need to know for the human eye regarding um, your exams. Okay, so we have the structure of the eye, and this looks like a very busy slide, but we're going to do it step by step. I'm going to start from the outside inwards, and then I'm going to do the three layers of the eye, which is the sclera, the choroid, and the retina. So let's start here by the conjunctiva. The conjunctiva is this membrane right around here that goes over the cornea, which is just below it. And the cornea is part of the sclera. It is a specialized disc of the, of the sclera. So at the front of the eye, the sclera forms a specialized, specialized disc, and that is called the cornea. Then just beneath or behind the cornea is the aqueous humor, which is a substance that fills the space here. And then there's the pupil, which is literally a hole in your eye. So you can see here there's a gap there. There's nothing there. And then you have your lens, which is held in place by the suspensory ligaments. And the suspensory ligaments attach the lens to the ciliary muscles, which form part of the choroid. But we'll get to the three layers now. Then behind the lens is the vitreous humor, which is this hole in a space here. It maintains the shape of your eye. So it maintains that round shape of your eye. Okay, now we get to the three layers of the eye. So we have the sclera, which forms right around here and on this side as well. And then we have the choroid, which is this dotted part here. It's dotted to show that it's slightly darker because we'll see in the next or well, two slides from now that it actually has a brown pigment. So it's shown that it's slightly darker. And then this innermost layer is the retina. And the retina has the receptors for sight. So sight is a sense. And we know that for a, a sensory impulse to be sent to your brain, you need a sense receptor. So the specialized sense receptors of the eye are rods and cones, and they are all along the retina. The yellow spot is the part that has the most cones. And then the blind spot is an area where there are no rods and cones because the rods and cones are leaving the eye or the retina as the optic nerve, which uh, sends the impulse to your brain. The impulse or the yeah, it transmits the impulse of sight to your brain. OK, this is a bit of a weird slide. I've never had something like this before in my um, PowerPoints, but this is just it works for some people. It doesn't work for others. It's a way to try to remember the different parts of the eye just because there are so many parts of the eye. So it's basically images associated with the different parts of the eye. So yeah, there's junk, someone throwing something in the dustbin, so it's junk, so it's the conjunctiva. There's the cornea, so there's a little corn there. Um, the aqueous humor, so I put a microphone there for like a comedy night, stand-up comedy, and then a little droplet for aqueous, like aqua water. And then the lens, cameras have a lens. Suspensory ligaments, so a little suspensory bridge or suspense bridge. And then the vitreous humor here, so it's also, again, the microphone for humor, humorous comedy, stand-up comedy. Here is the retina, so ret sounds like net, and it catches sight. And then you have your rod, so this is a fishing rod, and your cone, so that's a traffic cone. The yellow spots, so I put a sun there. The blind spots are glasses, because blind people wear glasses. And then the choroid sounds like steroids, so muscles. Sclera sounds like scare, scarer almost, so a little monster that's scary. And then the optic nerve, and this is someone losing their nerve. So this is just a, a simple, maybe not so simple for some people, way to remember the different parts of the eye because there are so many structures of the eye. Okay, so here is, here I've listed the different parts of the eye and then their structure and their function because this is what you need to know. The conjunctiva is a thin membrane and it is for protection. The cornea is a transparent disc and it is a specialized disc. And because it is transparent, it allows light into the eye. And because it is specialized, it refracts light onto the retina. So it goes, the light goes in here and it is refracted onto the retina, okay? Then we have the lens. Here's the lens over here. And it is biconvex, elastic, and transparent. So the way I always remember this is BET, B-E-T, biconvex, elastic, and transparent. And if you know the structure, it's very easy to get the function. So it alters its shape for near and distant vision. Because it is elastic, it can move. So um, yeah, it's elastic and biconvex. 
so we can move, it's very movable, so therefore we can alter its shape for near and distant vision. And then it is transparent, so it allows light through. If something is opaque, which is the opposite of transparent, it can't allow light through. So it needs to be transparent because it's where that's in the path of where the light travels. So it also refracts light onto the retina. Then the aqueous humor, it is the liquid between the cornea, so it's here, and the lens. So it's between the cornea and the lens, it's this liquid over here. It refracts light onto the retina. It supplies oxygen and nutrients to the cornea and the lens, and it maintains the shape of the cornea. So because it fills the space here, it pushes outwards a bit on the cornea, helping the cornea make that little bulge over there. And then the vitreous humor fills this whole space here, and it is a jetty-like substance behind the lens, and it also refracts light onto the retina and maintains the shape of the eye because it it fills this whole uh, this whole space. So it pushes outwards like that, maintaining the shape of the eye. And it's very easy to know at least one function for all of these, because all of them refract light onto the retina. And why they do that is because they are in the direct path of the light um, on its way to the retina. So light comes in through here, and it is refracted the whole time by every single thing. So the cornea, the aqueous humor, the lens, and the vitreous humor refract light onto the retina. And this is just a continuation of the structure and function of the parts of the eye. So we have the three um, layers of the eye. We have the sclera, the choroid, and the retina. The sclera is that white part of your eye that you can see um, that surrounds your iris, okay? And the iris is the colored part of your eyes. So if you have blue eyes, it's because your iris is blue. If you have brown eyes, it's because your iris is brown. So the white part around your iris is the sclera. So it is the outermost layer of your eye. Just beneath that is the choroid, and then just beneath that is the retina. Okay, so the sclera is tough. It is opaque, which means it's not transparent. It is non-elastic, and it is the outer covering. Okay, and its function is it maintains the shape of the eye because it is tough and non-elastic. So it's not very movable, so therefore it can maintain the shape. And then it also protects the eye. Then the choroid has blood vessels, it has a brown pigment, and it is continuous with the ciliary muscles, which are these muscles there that attach um, with the suspensory ligaments to the lens. Okay. So the brown pigment in the choroid is very important because it prevents the reflection of light in the eye by absorbing some of the light. So the light comes in through here and it is refracted onto the retina. And then it absorbs some of that light because if it doesn't absorb some of that light, that light is going to reflect all around in the eye and then um, it doesn't really get absorbed nicely by the receptors. So the brown pigment is important because it prevents the reflection of light in the eye by absorbing some of that light. So it doesn't reflect back around in the eye. Then the ciliary muscles alter the shape of the lens. So if they contract, it moves the lens so that the lens can alter for near, near or distant vision. Then the suspensory ligaments hold the lens in place and the iris alters the size of the pupil. And we'll get to that in the pupillary mechanism. Then we have the retina. The retina contains rods and cones, as we said previously. The rods and cones leave the eyes, the optic nerve, which we also said. We also said the yellow spot only has cones and the blind spot has no rods nor cones. Okay, and then the function of the retina. It is a light sensitive area where images are formed. That's why I said the retina is like a net because it catches the light and it forms the images. And then the cones enable you to see in bright light, the rods enable you to see in dim light, and then the optic nerve carries impulses to the brain. They asked in a past paper, um, why do nocturnal animals, or what enables nocturnal animals to see better in the night? So nocturnal animals are animals that are awake at night and sleep during the day. And how do they see at night? It's because they have more rods. So if they have more rods, it means they can see better in dim light, which is when there's nighttime. So that, just keep that in mind. They can ask questions like that. Binocular vision, you must know its definition and its importance. So what is binocular vision? Its definition is, it is vision in which both eyes are used together to form an image. And how does this happen? So each eye forms a 2D image and then the two 2D images that are formed by the eyes are combined to form a 3D image. So you can see things in 3D view. And why is this important? It's important because it gives a wider field view to humans. So 
I don't know if you've ever put your hand over one of your eyes. It cuts out half of what you're seeing. So in that way, having both eyes forming an image gives you a wider, uh, wider field view because you can see the peripheral vision is better. Now we get to accommodation. So you also need to know the definition for accommodation, and that is the ability of the eye to alter the convexity of the lens to form a clear image on the retina. So the convexity of the lens is how round or flat the lens is. So here you can see it's more rounded and here it is more flat. And this is in order to form a clear image on the retina at the back here, depending on how close or far the, um, the image is from the eye. So distant vision is regarded as objects further than six meters away from the eye, and near vision is regarded as objects closer than six meters to the eye. And I don't know if rhymes or little mnemonics or stories help you remember things, but Marlene, who did the um, human evolution recording, and I came up with this little story when we were studying for this, and it's the cat saw the lens refract. So the, we worked with near vision, and the cat walks closer to, the, to something that scares it. So the cat is busy walking close to something, and it gets scared, so it contracts. And then... Th so the C for cat is for the ciliary muscles. It contracts when it gets scared, when it walks closer to something, so it's going nearer to it. And then the suspensory ligaments are like, nah, chill bro. So the suspensory ligaments relax, they slacken. And now because the suspensory ligaments are what hold the lens in place, it allows for the tension on the lens to decrease. Because if the, if the suspensory ligaments are tense, it will pull the lens flat. But because they are relaxed, it allows the lens to, to become more convex because the tension decreases. And then the light rays that come in through here are refracted more because it is more convex. And then the light rays are focused onto the retina. And then for distant vision, it is completely the opposite. So if you know near vision, you can just do the opposite for distant vision. The cat, which is the ciliary muscles, now relax the further away it goes from the thing that scares it. And then the suspensory ligaments tighten, which increases the tension on the, on the lens. The lens becomes more convex. I mean, sorry, it becomes less convex because it's becoming flatter now. And then the light rays are refracted less. And the light rays are also focused onto the retina because whether it's distance or near vision, the light rays must always be focused onto the retina so an image can be formed. OK, so now we get to the pupillary mechanism. Again, you need to know the definition. So the definition is the process by which the diameter of the pupil is altered to allow a certain amount of light in. So this occurs when there is bright light and when there is dim light. So when you are in the presence of bright light, to protect your retina, your pupil constricts. So it becomes smaller so that less light can enter your eye because the, the um, light is very bright. But when it's dark and there's dimmer light, your pupil dilates to allow more light in. So it becomes bigger so that more light can enter in there. So yeah, you can see in bright light, it constricts, it's small, so little light can go in. So this is to protect your retina. And if it's bright light, the, I mean, sorry, if it's dim light, your pupil dilates, becomes bigger to allow more light in. And then again, I work with bright light. So this is the way I remember it. For bright light, the radial muscles relax. So R and R. Radial muscles relax, then circular muscles contract, and then the pupil constricts because it is bright light, so it constricts, which means it gets smaller to allow less light into the eye. So the radial muscles relax, R, R. Circular muscles contract, C, C. The pupil constricts and less light goes into the eye. So this is now for bright light. For dim light, it is just the opposite. The radial muscles contract, the circular muscles relax, the pupil widens or the pupil dilates, and more light enters the eye. Okay. And now we get to visual defects. And there's four different kinds of visual defects, and these two are linked with each other. So you get hypermetropia and myopia. So hypermetropia is long-sightedness. It is a long word, so it's long-sightedness. And myopia is short-sightedness because it is a short word. That's how I remember it. And for 
Hypermetropia and myopia is very counterintuitive because you think long sightedness is you can see um, short and you can't see far. And short sightedness is you can uh, see far but you can't see short, but it's actually the other way around. Long sightedness and short sightedness is what you can see. So if you are long sighted, it means you can see far but you can't see near. If you are short sighted, it means you can't see close up but you can see far. So I wear glasses because I can't see far away, which means I'm short-sighted. Sometimes people uh, mix that up a bit. The causes of long-sightedness is the eyeball is too round and the lens can't become convex. So we know from um, accommodation that convexity, a higher convexity, causes the light to be refracted more. So basically what happens with long-sightedness is the image is formed behind the retina because the light is not refracted at a like sharp enough angle, so it doesn't form on the retina. Therefore, to increase the convexity, the treatment is convex lenses because this increases the convexity of the light coming in, so it refracts light more. Um, and then for myopia, which is short sightedness, the causes is the eyeball is too long and the lens can't become flat, which means that the image is formed before the retina. So if the if the lens can't become flat, it means that the lens is currently in a more convex state. And the opposite of convexity is concavity. So to counteract this lens being in a somewhat convex state because it's not flattening enough, you treat it with concave lenses. So the person's glasses will have concave lenses. Then we get astigmatism. Astigmatism is when the cornea is too curved or rounded, and this can cause fatigue, distorted images, headaches, and squinting, and you treat it with spectacles. And then cataracts is when a, an opaque or cloudy um, substance forms over your lens. So it uh, prevents you from seeing images properly because your lens should be transparent. But now there's like this cloud that distorts your images. It doesn't allow the light to enter properly. And the treatment is to remove your lens and replace it with a synthetic lens. And this synthetic lens is called an intraocular implant. And you do this by surgery. Okay, so then this is the end of our session. Please like and subscribe. Leave any questions you have in the comments and I will get to them as soon as I can. And I posted on our little community chat that you can send me an email if you would like any three PDFs of the PowerPoints I use in my slides. And you just have to attach a screenshot of your subscription to my channel. Good luck with your upcoming exams.